I'm in my late 20s, and I've been dating a single mother with two children for a year and a half. We met at work and began dating for pleasure. She has many qualities in a woman that I like. She's attractive, able to hold a professional job, and is able to raise children in a relatively healthy way. She has also been receptive to some of the things you talk about on your show, such as problems with welfare programs and immigration. However, as someone who looks forward to having a child of my own, or two someday, I am uncertain if it makes sense to settle down with her or if it would be best to move on and start fresh. That's from Luke. Hello, Luke. Can you hear me? Yes, the fan can you hear me. I can. How you doing, brother? Uh, very well, my friend. Uh, how are you? I am very well. I am very well. Is there any more kind of background you want to give me to this scenario? Uh, sure. I was uh, working at a job, at a second job, doing personal care work, and she was my manager or sort of a supervisor who worked in the office while I was out in the homes. And uh, she'd only been working there for a couple of months before she decided it wasn't uh, the, the kind of career she wanted, and she decided to move along. But we kept in touch, and we, you know, we texted back and forth, and it was really kind of flirty in the beginning. And she was, uh, hang on, hang on, man. Are you saying you bagged a hot boss? Seriously, yeah, I did. Okay, I got to put on the Tana, Tommy Sotomayor uh, background uh, disco for this story because it's just a great story. But go on, <laughs> dear penthouse. I was working for this woman. Anyway, go ahead. So yeah, but when she when she first started as our manager, we all sat down in a room together, and I was like, "Whoa, this woman is killer. She's like a she's like an 11. and she she looked really put together. She was um, that that's a ten with an erect penis next to it, just in case anybody doesn't know what the eleven is. But go on, right? Just kind of like what kind of a guy could have a woman like this? That's the first thing that went through my mind. And then um, when when at some point we got talking one on one, and I started asking her more personal questions, and I could kind of see that you know she was sort of maybe getting a little nervous or, or engaged in the way that I was interacting with her. But anyways, um, she moved on and got a, a different job and we kept in touch and we started dating. And um, she, she, she does have a kid. She's got a four-year-old daughter and um, about a year, we, we, so we didn't see each other a whole lot. It was like once a week and we mostly just, you know, basically have sex uh, once a week for an hour. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Uh, youth. But anyway, go on. <laughs> but we would we would communicate a lot in between, you know, with, with the telephone and with text me text messages, and we'd fill each other in on uh, what's going on in each other's lives. And and as time went on, we it kind of snowballed, and we really started to uh, really care for each other. And you know, we had, we did have a few arguments here and there, and a lot of it was because I started listening to your show and I started bringing up some of these things I was hearing about and thinking about. And she had a hard time with some of it at first. And some of, some of these arguments led, led to us breaking up. And then a, a week or two would go by and we'd kind of like text and say, hey, I miss you. How are you doing? And then um, so it just kind of it just kind of felt like it was hard for us to stay apart. Like in, and when we were broken apart, I really felt like sort of disheveled. I felt like I'd, I'd sort of missed um, I'd, like I'd lost a best friend and maybe I was uh, missing out on a great opportunity. So that's that's kind of where I'm going. Am I, do you want me to go any further with that? Uh, hey, I'm I'm happy to listen until you've got uh, you give me the big picture. Oh, okay. Well, <clears throat> so she adopted um, another baby girl six months ago, and so I've sort of seen this kid come into our our lives, her her life, but our lives because I've I've spent time with this kid, you know, uh, every week or so too, and. Uh, not during the sex, of course, but... Um, <laughs> okay, let's just take that for granted. Right, <laughs> right, right. So I've seen, I'm kind of seeing these kids grow up a little bit, and they know who I am, and they come over to my house, and we sometimes we go to the park, and we do, like, um, we, we might go to a parade, and they're kind of growing on me, and, I, and I'm growing on them, I think, a little bit, too. And so uh, it's kind of like... When I first met her, I kind of thought, you know, I want to get into this, and this is going to be for fun. And I was sort of a MGTOW guy um, because of some previous experiences with women that I'd had. I'd kind of given up on the whole thing. And I was like, well, I'm just going to get involved with the woman, but I'm not going to let it get too serious because I want to do Keep my your own addresses. Keep your own addresses. <laughs> right. Right. And um, so, yeah, time's gone by, and 
now I'm kind of thinking, now my mind has changed so much. I've grown. I grow every year, and I started listening to your show, and I've thought about a lot of different things, and now I kind of want some kids of my own. Maybe her kids are rubbing off on me a little bit. I want to make a change in the world. I want to, uh, I want to like, I want to have, make a stamp, uh, make a mark on this earth. And, and uh, I did have a, a child with a, from a previous relationship, and that, that went horribly wrong, and um, I failed at that miserably, and I learned a lot from it. And now I kind of want to try again. And it's like, should I should I take these kids and start and go run with them, and then have some more kids, and then kind of have a whole big happy family thing, or should I sort of uh, move on and start from scratch? All right, all right. Well, I, listen, great, great explanation. I, I appreciate that. Um, my my mind is a bee's hive of questions, so I'll try and narrow it down. But um, one thing, Luke, you, you mentioned kind of there at the end that, that you already have a kid? Yes, sir. And uh, what's the story there? Uh, I was uh, 21. I was 20 years old. I was in college. And I met a really pretty young woman who was not in college but was visiting a friend. I think, I think we may have well determined that you have a type. <laughs> she was hot. Anyway, go on. Definitely, especially at that time. And uh, Oh, yeah. No, I get it. I get it. Yep, yep. And so if I could go back and tell myself, you know, red flag, red flag, I totally would. Um, so anyways, I was dating this, this girl in college for six months, and it was just great. You know, we were, I was, we got really, really close, really involved. We had lots and lots of sex to the fan, like every two days or every day. And um, we kept talking about the future and maybe, you know, having kids someday. And then it was like, uh, I haven't had my period. Um, I'm I took a test. I'm pregnant, and I totally freaked out. And you were talking with how? Your- how did she? Uh, how did she, I always? I always hate to ask this question if the woman was not here because usually you just get the secondhand slide by story. But how? How did she get pregnant there, Luke? Was she? Was she not on protection? Well, she was on the birth control pill, and she eventually. Uh, I kept asking her like, "How could this happen? How could this happen?" If she's on the birth control pill, and she had Crohn's disease, and she talked to her doctor, and according to her. The Crohn's disease had sort of um, made the pill ineffective or less effective. Well, um, so this is the doctor who diagnosed her Crohn's and who she also got the birth control pill from, right? So he would have told her that because that would be his responsibility as a healthcare provider. He would have told her that this is not an effective form of birth control because you have Crohn's disease. Right. So this is not something she figured out later, right? It is something she figured out later. She didn't know. Apparently, she didn't know uh, when she was taking the pill that her Crohn's would be affected at all. So her doctor didn't tell her that the Crohn's disease would interfere with the efficacy of the birth control pill. And that's her story. Yes, sir. And she didn't look it up or so. Okay. I mean, she's not here. And even if she was, she could just stick by her story. So... I I am somewhat skeptical, but uh, uh, that's what she says. Oh, it was the Crohn's. Okay, it's always something. Uh, so um, so she got pregnant, and then she decided to keep the kid, obviously. I, I guess, is that fair to say? Well, we actually had uh, a discussion about what to do. We She didn't want to adopt the kid, and we we talked about abortion, and we I definitely really wanted that at the time. I was all for that. And, you know, she wasn't, she didn't want to do that, but she was willing to do it for me. But her, her Crohn's prevented her from getting the okay from her doctor to do so. So uh, I stuck it out. It was really hard. And kind of like the conversation you had with two callers ago, I had a combination of depression and anxiety. And I was just like crushed. Oh, isn't that, that's horrible, right? Yeah. I mean, I didn't know what to do. I mean, I was, I wasn't even, I was like halfway through college and I was like already 50K in debt. And uh, I got this kid coming along and I didn't know what my parents would think and my grandmother would think. And it was just like it was just uh, a disaster in my mind. And I was like shattered glass and I had to slowly put the pieces back together again. Right. Um, You were how much in debt? I was 50 grand in debt. From school? Yep. At 21? Yeah, actually, I was 20. I the. Yeah, I was 20 years old at the time. What? 
Yes, sir. I was. Uh, I went to school for aviation. I wanted to be a pilot, so I was going into debt real quickly, like twenty k per year for flight lessons, particularly. Wow. Wow. Okay. And how long was it going to take to become a pilot? Actually, uh, it only takes a, a couple of years. I mean, if you if you want to do it, you can probably do it in a year. If you really just put your nose to the grindstone and get all your hours and requirements in, yeah, you can get in there pretty quickly. And how long was uh, you – oh, it's the flight time, right? That's really expensive. And how, how long was it going to take for you to do it? It was I, – I could have been done in, you know, another year. But I decided to give up on that and go for Plan B, which was much cheaper – and uh, go for the GIS certificate, uh, Geographic Information Systems, because I I'd kind of lost motivation and I didn't want to keep putting money into that. And I just kind of by that time I just wanted to get out of school because of the pregnancy and all. Well, because of that and because of the financial um, problems that I was causing by staying in the aviation management program, I did have a, a private pilot's license, so that kind of like satisfied me to some degree. I kind of thought, you know what, I always wanted a pilot's license. I got that. I'm going too far into debt. I'm, I kind of just want to get a degree now and get out of school and get out of here and start making some money. That was my goal at that time. Right. Okay. Okay. And so you got out and you were licensed. And then what happened? Well, I wasn't licensed to be a commercial pilot. I was just licensed to be a private pilot. Um, I got out of school, and I just like most people, I really didn't have any skills or any, you know, anything, uh, any value as far as a career. So I, I ended up working for ten dollars an hour at an auto parts store for a year and a half. I was making yeah nine fifty an hour. Ouch! Oh man, that's rough. And I mean, were you able to defer? Debt payments on the 50k. I mean, that's a bit of a sideways jagged pill to swallow every month, isn't it? I did defer the payments for two or three years. Yes, and uh, with the interest, it was racking up pretty quickly, like two or three thousand dollars a year. Oh man, that's rough. Um, okay, I won't go down that rabbit hole because that's about money and all that. But um, <clears throat> did you? I mean, did you think of marrying your girlfriend? I mean, what did you do for that? Well, I, I did my best. Like, it was really hard, and but I considered myself a strong person, so I did everything I could. Um, I moved to her town, and I moved. Uh, we got an apartment together, and um, I, I told her I wouldn't marry her. My dad told me, he said, he said whatever you do, don't get married. And that kind of stuck with me. So I didn't marry her. And I actually only... Why, why, why did your dad say that? I mean, holy, passed down the MGTOW from the elder tree. But uh, why did your dad say don't get married? I don't know. I mean, maybe he had his own experiences that he didn't share with me. You don't know? Your dad gives you massive advice like, don't marry the mother of your child. And you don't know why he said it? <laughs> That's true. Was there a sports game on? Was he distracted? Like, <clears throat> wouldn't you want to... I mean, that seems like pretty big advice to be getting from Pops. Yeah, it's pretty disappointing. Wow. Well, I, I mean, I don't know what his reasons were any more than you, but I'm sort of surprised that, uh, don't get married. All right, let's see what's on Netflix. I mean, <laughs> that's the big deal, right? Yeah, that's, that's how I learned by wisdom. I learned. You might want to ask him a few more questions about that, you know, given that you're thinking about getting married again, right? Well, that's the thing. I mean, it's hard to have conversations with my own family. They've always been sort of emotionally very distant, and it's always been um, – they've never talked to me about personal or emotional things. It's always just like do things this way or do things that way or or just they don't talk about it at all. And I just have to kind of live by experience and make my own mistakes. And, and uh, maybe this whole situation could have been prevented if they'd been more straightforward. Right, right, right. You said there were red flags with the mother of your child. What were they? You know, just for the advocation of the other <clears throat> young men out there who are going to get dick-napped, as it sounds like you were a little bit. Right. She's pretty. Lots of sex. Funnily enough, I'm not making good decisions. <laughs> right? We all, we've all we all been there. Yeah. I mean, well, she wore lots and lots of makeup. Um, she was very, very shy and quiet. Uh, she had some tattoos. And she had been raped once or twice in her life. Once or twice? Yep. Is that what she said? Yeah. 
just hadn't narrowed it down or uh i just don't know if i, I don't remember correctly it, she either, either had been raped once or twice by my memory oh, she didn't say she didn't say i don't know it was once or twice something like that yeah i knew she i knew definitely said, for, she said either said once or twice but you can't remember is that right correct okay was she raped as a child or as an adult i think it was in her mid-teens you right right now I have, as the audience does not have the enormous pleasure of looking at your Skype picture. Uh, do you think that? I mean, you're a very good-looking guy. Do you think that the girls were also bowled over by your slightly stubbled hunkasoriousness? Well, thank you, and I think so. Okay, yeah, because it could have been two two tens crashing at each other to produce <laughs> sparks and disaster, right? Yeah, I definitely didn't have the like mental maturity or the assets to attract these women. So I'm assuming that's what it was. Right. And and you, I mean, you seem to have a lot of charisma just looking at, I mean, obviously chatting with you and the confidence and, and charisma and all that, right? Uh, to some degree, I am pretty much, I'm a, I'm a private person, but um, I don't know. I, I feel like I listen to you enough to where I feel comfortable talking to you. So maybe that's a part of it too. Were these interracial relationships or were you... Staying local. I am. Uh, I'm biracial. My mother is a white Midwestern woman. My father's from Kenya. Um, so anybody I date is pretty much in an interracial relationship. Um, but uh, this, the woman that I dated and had a child with, was a white woman, and so is this woman that I'm dating now. Right. As far as I understand it, from Barack Obama, your ears should be bigger. But uh, anyway, that's a topic for another <laughs> time. So, um, so the the white woman that you were dating. <clears throat> In your when you were twenty twenty one, who had the kid, you moved to the town that she was in, and you didn't marry her. Was that partly because of your dad, or was there some other reason? It was partly because. Or did you not want to at all? I didn't really want to. Like this whole the whole situation was a huge mistake in my mind, and I had failed miserably, and I was just angry and bitter, and I just uh, was always sort of thinking in my mind what I could have done differently and I wasn't I wasn't content at all and I was I was pretty much getting ready to leave and I only stayed we lived together for like nine months so through about half of her pregnancy and four months after the child was born and then I decided to bail <sighs> okay um, tell me a little bit about that moment I was so frustrated and upset and angry with what my life had become that I sort of just dumped him and left. And I sort of blamed her for everything. I, I, everything was her fault in my mind and my life would have been better and I, would, I still would have been having fun back in college with my friends and that's just the thought process that I had at the time. And what were your feelings about that? I mean, mother of your child plus baby. Well, at the time, I felt like a huge sense of relief. I felt great. I felt I did move back to my college town, and I was hanging out with my old buddies again, and I sort of pretended like it never happened. I, I would go and visit my child every week or two, and, and uh, you know, that was nice. But then I found out, you know, she was dating somebody else eventually, and then that's kind of when I realized, like, holy shit, uh, I lost my family here. But it didn't, you know. And what do you mean you hang on, hang on, hang on? Don't give me that, Luke. You lost your family. You walked out. That's right. I mean, it wasn't like you lost them. I mean, you left them. Yeah. I'm not trying to make you feel bad. I'm just, you know, I think we got to characterize things correctly, right? I mean, you walked out on your family. You went and hung out with your friends and you had fun. And you became a yo-yo dad, like the bungee dad. I'm here. I'm gone, right? And, yeah, of course she's at some point probably gonna, not going to st sit and stare at your picture, however pretty it is, right? She's not going to sit and stare at your picture. She's going to start dating someone else. But that's not you losing your family, right? You left your family. Yeah, yeah, but maybe... Well, right or wrong, it's just that those are the facts, right? Yes. All right. And what about, does she, did she want child support or how, how, does, how was she surviving? Uh, she ended up moving in with her parents, and she did file for child support pretty quickly after that. And I was pretty upset about that. And that just, it just. Why were you upset about that? 
I mean, I get that you didn't want to give her money, but you did have a kid, right? Well, I, I did. I was sending her money. I was sending her, uh, I think, like 300, 400 bucks a month on my own without anybody telling me to do it. And then she goes and, and signs up for child support anyways, which kind of upsets me because it's like sending the dogs to come after me and take something by force. So that yeah, there may be tax reasons. I mean, who knows, right? But uh, all right, or whatever her family was telling her to do. But it sort of it sort of broke uh, the trust between us, and and it just sort of like sort of made us more enemies, at least in my mind, when that happened. Well, also, I mean, to to put it in terms that are probably not overly sensitive, but may have some validity, um, because she comes, she's a single mom, so she comes with a huge expense. And if you're sending money voluntarily, her sexual market value could decline because any man who commits to her, if she can't rely on your income, he's going to have to cover that. So she probably wanted also to get a more secure pipeline of money from you so that her sexual market value wouldn't be declined if you decided to stop paying, right? Right. And what, what is your relationship like with your child now? Well, you know, in the beginning, I was able to see him like every two, three weeks. And then we started having disagreements as far as like where and when we could meet and when she would bring him over to see me and when I would go down and see him. But it seemed like she always wanted me to do things around her way and her schedule. And um, I ended up taking her to court over to try and get custody. And then she made, she made a whole list of all these things I had to do before I could see him. And... So I started feeling like the court was more in control of my kid than I was. And like she, and it seemed like she was putting up as many barriers as she could so that I couldn't see him. And that ups upset me even more. So then I just sort of stopped seeing him as much. It started going from like three weeks to three months to a year. And then she got married. And then I sent her an email like, hey, you know, how are you doing? Can you send me some photos? And then she responds by saying, um, I'm, mar I'm getting married now and we don't want you to talk to us anymore. And that sort of broke me more than anything else ever had in my life. And how long had it been since uh, you'd seen your son, Luke, at that point? Probably a year. So it was more a confirmation of what was already happening than something completely different, right? What do you mean? Well, you already weren't a dad for a year. I mean, effectively, in terms of seeing your son. So it wasn't like you were seeing him every week or, or you know, you had half custody and then it changed. I mean, you hadn't seen him for a year. And then she says, it's over. And so it wasn't like a huge change from the last year, other than it was the end of hope that it could continue or, or change at some point in the future, right? Right. I mean, if, if I haven't seen some girl for a year and then she breaks up with me, it's not like she's moving out. Do you know what I mean? Yep. And I guess you don't know how he's doing, right? I have no idea. I don't even know where they are. I mean, I see, I see kids like him on this, you know, that could look like him when I'm out in public. And, and I think like, man, I wonder what he looks like. I wonder what he's into. You know, I wonder. And, and I, you know. I've grown so much, like I feel like I know that I could be such a great force in this person's life if I were allowed to be, and my and my family, if my family were involved, some of them um, could also have really good positive effects uh, on him and and make him a good person for this uh, world. But it's it's it really hurts me that I I can't participate in that. And are you still on the hook for the child support? No, actually, uh, she asked me if her husband, if, if I could sign adoption papers so that he would legally become her husband's, in turn, and in turn, I would not have to pay child support. And at the time, I was paying back, so this was like three, or three years ago, and I was still paying back these bills for this $50,000 uh, loan that I'd taken for school, which was like six or $700 a month. My monthly income might have been like uh, two thousand dollars a month or something like that. So I ended up signing for it um, partly to not be legally liable for this uh, for him anymore, and also just to help pay the bills. 
Do you know anything about her husband? I really don't know anything about him. Oh, they're not like I don't know if you can see him on Facebook or. No, I can't. Um, my my mom did go to uh, one of my son's birthday parties, which I was invited. I was invited to go to, but I declined to go to because it was a big public event, and there was going to be all her family there and friends. And I thought I said, "I thank you for inviting me, but I'm not going to be able to make it." Um, I'm sorry. This was for your son's. For my son's birthday party. Yes, yes. And when was this? Uh, probably four years ago or something. Right. So and your mom went? My mom went and she did meet uh, this guy and said that, you know, he seems to be a really nice guy. Is he black? A white guy. A white guy. Yeah. So I do, you know, I mean, I'm glad to hear that he's a really nice guy from what it sounds like, but I'm also very envious and jealous of this guy now. Well, you did leave. That's true. You did leave. So you have a kid with the white girl, and the white guy ends up adopting your kid. Yeah. All right. And the new girl, well, not girl, she's a, <laughs> the new mom, the, the new girlfriend, she knows all of this history, right? Yes. And she is fine with this. Uh, not fine, but I mean, she's okay with it. Yeah, she understands. I think I think she kind of has a good idea of what happened and how I what how I might have been then and she sees who I am now and I think maybe she's you know pretty confident that I'm a decent person. Right. And um when she says she, when you say that she's able to raise children in a relatively healthy way, what do you mean? Well, uh, she is very good when it comes to like disciplining her kids. Like she doesn't yell at them. She doesn't hit them. She's very caring and emotional, and she wants to listen to them. Uh, she makes sure they have good food, and she makes sure they're loved. And she is sort of everything that I'd want in a woman uh, that would be raising my kids someday. And who takes care of the? You said she's got a professional job. Uh, who takes care of her kids when she's working? So this is the interesting part. Uh, one of her kids goes to a private school for kindergartners. And then during the day, she's separated. During the day, her husband, legal husband, who lives with her, is watching the six-month-old. Okay, so hey, does he not work? He works part-time. Okay. Is he a white guy? Yeah. Okay. Got it. And um, what, um, what were the issues that had you break up? You said it had something to do with uh, some of the stuff I talk about and other things. Oh, uh, I think, like, I don't know, I was trying to come up with facts, and, and I ended up saying, like, I was trying to come up with some facts about some topic, and I don't remember what topic it was, but during the conversation I said, you know, every time it seems like I talk to women about this stuff, they always get really upset and angry. And then she says, well, you're a sexist, and blah, blah, blah. And I said, I'm not a sexist. you got to prove that. So we, we, we ended up hanging up and breaking up, and then we called back, you know, we started talking again a few weeks later, and I, I, I asked her, like, do you really think I'm sexist? And... She's like, no, I was just getting emotional, and, and she sort of admitted that she was wrong, and, and she understood why that was wrong. So, and did she apologize? She did apologize after I demanded an apology, oh, several times. Ah, okay. So she, she, her, she separated but not divorced. Her husband, who she's still legally married to, lives with her, and takes care of the kid during the day. Yes. I got to tell you, man, <laughs> I feel like I'm at a different planet sometimes. Like, you're a lot younger than me, obviously, right? I don't know what the hell's going on in the dating world these days. But, you know, I met my wife. We were both single. We got married and had kids. Like this, like, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> like, Jesus, age Christ. You got a kid with a, 
you got a what a, 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 a kid with a white girl who's now adopted by the white husband and and now you're there's this white couple and you're around but the, the, they're separated but the, the dad's still living there and it's like man alive things are getting kind of complicated i mean just with you i don't know but things seem to be getting kind of complicated out there man does that seem, I mean, is it just me or that no, seems a little. You're exactly right. It is, it is kind of crazy. Are there no single girls that you can find that is not, oh, hi, here's my ex-husband. He'll be sleeping next door. I mean, here's my <laughs> current husband I'm separated from. No nice girls who are single out there? I don't know. Not. I don't know if they, uh, if there's a lot of them that would get me or get, you know, the kind of stuff that you talk about on this show, but I'd like to, that's the way I'm calling you is like, you know, should I start to look for one of those women or should, or should I stay where I am and try to make the best out of what I have? Well, I, I mean, obviously I, I can't answer that, but, uh, um, it's complicated, right? I mean, she adopted a baby girl after she separated from her husband who's still living there. Right. And that's kind of how she was able to adopt that baby because she was able to say, Hey, uh, I am married, and this is what we look. This is how we live. So it was wait a minute. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Are you saying that she stretched the truth a little bit when getting this adoption going? That's right. No, no, she didn't. Did she really? Yeah. Why? Well, she wanted to adopt a baby, and she found a no, way to I, I get that. I get that. You know, I want a Maserati. That doesn't mean I'm going to go steal one. And why, why, why did she want a baby? She has a boyfriend, which would be you. I mean, if I was dating a girl... And I wanted kids at some point, and it sounds like you want kids like that you're going to stick around with at some point. If I was dating a girl, and she knew I wanted kids, and she decided to adopt while we'd been going out for a year, I, I'd take that a little personally. Like what, I'm not good enough to be the father of your child? you got to take some stranger's kid? Right. I well, don't know if that popped into your head, but that's what just popped into mine. Yeah, well, I don't know. Um, I think earlier I might have mentioned that I was sort of MGTOW and I wasn't planning, not that long ago, I, d I was planning on kind of going on the rest of my life without having children or getting married. But now it, this this kind of idea of having children is sort of new to me or recent. So she probably didn't expect me to ever give her any children. In fact, last year I was talking about getting a vasectomy. I'm 29 years old. But that's not how I right. think anymore. I think you may have an ex-girlfriend who will give you one for free, but it just might not be that pretty. Um, listen, I, I got to tell you, to me, it's enormously disturbing that she would have falsified her marital situation with regards to the adoption. I mean, she had the first child is not adopted, right? No, and that child was not by her legal husband either. Oh, seriously, man? Yep. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, where am I? <laughs> what planet have I landed on? Everybody's in a big, giant vat of intertwining tentacles. Okay. All right. Crash helmet. I've assumed crash position. So this woman was married... And she had a child, but not by the father, not by the husband she was married to. Right. After, after she was separated from her legal husband, she met a man. Now, her friend set her up with a man, and they were at a bar, and she ended up sleeping with him that night. She doesn't recall it. She doesn't know. It's, I don't know if she was too drunk or if she was drugged. Oh, her excuse is she was blackout drunk, right? That's what she says. She says she doesn't remember yeah, it at I've all. I've had one of those on this show before, too. And this man... I couldn't th remember a thing. This man had just gotten out of prison a week before, and she didn't know Oh, no, that. no, no. 
you're you're trolling me now, right? No, you're shitting no. me, right? This is this is no seriously. You're you're like reading a synopsis of a Mexican soap opera from hell, right? I mean, you're not. I wish you just I was, got out of prison. I wish I was that good of a writer, Stefan, or I wish I was that creative. Seriously, I mean, tell me there's a water buffalo involved here somewhere, and I'll just like my life, my circle will become complete. <laughs> Fuck. All right. Okay. Um, guy gets okay because I'm losing the timeline here. So the 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 kid is four, right? Her daughter. The daughter's four now. Yes. Okay, so she was married for how long? Uh, probably two or three years. Yeah, why would you need to know that? Okay, so she was married for two to three years. She's separated from her husband. She got set up by a friend of hers with a guy who just got out of prison. She got blackout drunk, got pregnant, and then got back together with her husband? Well, she she was still separated from her husband, and, ended up, and st she ended up dating this guy that impregnated her for about a year. And this guy would was a jerk. You know, he, would, he treated her bad. He had like six or seven other children with other women already, and he would steal stuff from her and... Hang on, I'm enjoying the tsunami-like rise of the gene pool here. Ah, what a wonderful height we can see from this idiocracy reproduction system. Okay, go on. So they were together for about a year. This guy had six or seven kids with other Yeah, he, he was women. A, he didn't work very much. He sort of mooched off her. He took advantage of her. Uh, they split up. I don't know if she was in a desperate situation, and that's why she stayed and tried to work it out with him. But she ended up leaving him and uh, moving back in with her... Uh, separated husband because it just worked better that way as far as taking care of the kids. The separated husband is the uh, the separated husband is the one that ended up signing the legal papers for uh, this child that was born out of wedlock with the other guy. Okay, my I, the Muslims come and take over. We don't know what the fuck they're <laughs> doing anymore. Like, come on in, come on in and take over because I don't know how Sharia law is worse than this shit. All right. Um, so if I understand, Whitey McCuckerson is spending his days tending to the daughter of the ex-prison convict who drunk fucked his wife, and now he is raising her. That's right. Dude, are you kidding me? What the fuck are you doing? Me? Ah, yeah, seriously, what are you doing? What kind of people are these? Well, you know, the, this woman is not sort of the trailer trash, permanent underclass woman you, you might be imagining. No, I get. She's hot and she's got a professional job. I get that. I don't care. See, I don't want to have sex with her. So I may be able to slap you with your own penis and <laughs> try and wake you up. I mean, come on, man. What, what kind of mess is all this? What what are you what are you walking into here? I don't really know. Yeah, you do. I mean, when you tell this story, what do you think of it? Well, she messed up, I messed up, and maybe and we've changed. She's changed a lot. I've changed a lot. She just and lied to get a baby. Come on! Come on! Is this situation, this whatever it is, I don't even know. I mean, the words that are floating around in my head, I'll just keep to myself. <clears throat> do you think this is the best you can do? No. Some woman who's got her ex husband or who's still married to her who's lying about getting babies who got basically if she's right about being have he had sex with her when she was blackout drunk or passed out basically the rape spawn of a prison like i mean god almighty seriously well that's the thing stefan like i know i can do well um but you know, when you're with somebody for a while, you ha you already have a lot invested in them. You kind of know each other really well, and you have to. That's start why you don't. That's why you don't have sex with them until you get to know them. You guys jumped into bed, right? It was probably a month or two after we started dating. And did you know all of this stuff about her life when you decided to have sex with her? Yes, I did. And you still felt this was a a good use of penis time. 
I did at the time, yeah. Right. Well, I'm just telling you from the outside, there seems to be some dysfunction involved in this <laughs> situation. I'm sorry, like, I don't know how to, I don't know how to put it well, obviously. In, a, in a way that you're going to hear. Can you not find a... A, a nice, a nice young girl uh, who's not in this family tree. That's like a Mobius strip of conveyor belts of dysfunction. I mean, do you do you not think that you could like some young girl who doesn't have all this complicated history and and who just is a nice person and a responsible person and is interested in you and and you can settle down without this stuff. This mess. Well, Stefan, I'm I'm confident that I could have a lot of girls if I wanted them, but it's hard to find one that's not, you know, a complete leftist or, you know, it, it's just hard to find one that I think is uh is good for me. And maybe if I worked, maybe online dating would probably help. But just being doing the the day to day where I go out in public and go to work, I don't see myself meeting anybody that way. So. I could, you know, I could get with a woman someday, but it would uh, it would be hard to find kind of what I'm looking for or somebody who can understand some of the things you're talking about on this show. Well, of course, unless you decided to do something public, right? If you started a YouTube channel or something like that, you know, good looking, articulate people seem to not have much trouble finding listeners, right? It seems like they have a better chance. Yeah. So, I mean, you could do something public and just see who knocks on your door, uh, so to speak. And, um, I mean, I obviously can't tell you what to do. It's your life, but, uh, this is some convoluted stuff. Right. And I understand that it's crazy, but the reason I called you today is because I really, I want your opinion on how crazy it really is. Cause you know, you can look at some things from your own perspective, but it's, the perspective of others that's really helpful sometimes. So I really appreciate well, here's, you. Well, you know, if I were a woman, Luke, this is there are a couple of things that I would be concerned about with you. Um, when you talked about your son, you only really talked about how hard it was for you. And you did try and give yourself a bit of victim halo with regards to all of this, right? Yes, I did. And there wasn't much of what it did to your son. But I did mention how much I wanted to make an impact on his life. After, Absolutely. after I started no, to realize I, I, how much I messed up. I get everything. all of that. I get all of that. But... For some reason, your ex-girlfriend really, really wanted you out of his life. That would be a red flag for me as a woman. Right? Because you're like, well, you know, she just wanted me to have nothing to do. And we didn't like, I hadn't talked to him for a year. And, and then I tried to get in contact. And she's like, don't come around. Don't write. I'd be like, well, why? Right? What, what happened? What did you do? That the mother of your child doesn't want you at anywhere near her son. And that the man she married is like, well, we don't want that guy anywhere near the kid. And I want to adopt him and we'll let him off child support. We'll just completely cut contact with the biological father of the child. I'm just, I, you know, maybe there's fantastic answers for all of this and we don't have to get into what they may or may not be. But I'm just telling you that would be a red flag for me, a huge one. Like you have a kid, you abandoned the kid, you didn't see the kid much. And right now, You've legally signed away rights to the kid. You're not paying child support. So you're able to do that as a human being. And I'm, you know, I, I get that it's complicated and I get that she had her decisions as well. But you did try and make a go with it with the mother. And the end result of you trying to be a father is that you are, other than biologically, not a father at all. Now, if you were to tell, like, if you, let's say, you don't date this single mom with the, Two kids, one she falsified for, and the other one she was too drunk to remember the interaction. 
Um, if, if I heard that you were dating someone like that, come on, man, a quality woman hearing this story, what the hell do you think she's going to say? Right. I don't do trailer park boys. I'm sorry. <laughs> right. Yeah. Now you're either going to sort of figure out how you ended up in this environment, in this situation. Or not. Now, if you don't, right, then you can just keep doing what you're doing. And well, I mean, sorry, I don't mean to laugh, right? But, but what do you think your MGTOW brothers in, in spirit would say to this story? Uh, I don't know. What do you think? Oh, come on. Of course you do. What do you think? If you, if you, if you got this, like if Sandman got this letter, right, and read it, yeah, what would he say? Honestly, Stefan, I'm having a hard, I'm drawing blanks here. Um, I, I'd say that, you know, he'd probably have something to say about the woman's side and the man's side for sure, but he'd have something to say about how it's a shame that a man can't participate in his son's life, even if he turns around, turns his ways around and, and decides that he can do good. Would he say that this is a stable and healthy now Walt to get involved with? Absolutely not. All right. So there's the certainty. Right. If you, if you have your head on straight from the beginning and you get involved, well, if you had your head on straight from the beginning, you wouldn't get involved with something like this. But if you're sort of picking up the pieces and you fall into this, and, you know, how can you, you know, how, after you have so much invested in this person, in this relationship, oh, no. like, how can you turn it no, around? No, no, no. Do not go rubber bones on me, brother. Do not give me this victim. Well, you know, if this just happens to you, come on. You found this woman sexually attractive. I don't believe you waited a month or two, but I'm going to accept that you said that. You found this woman sexually attractive. She found you sexually attractive. There was sexual tension from the very beginning. And you made very specific and particular choices, right? You cannot go all, you know, I don't let people go rubber bones on this show, right? Where you just kind of go limp and stuff happens to you. Right. You are making very particular and specific choices about the women you get involved in, about the red flags you ignore, about abandoning your son about signing him over for another man to raise, and you have no idea whether this is a good or bad man. You have no idea if he's hitting your kid. You have no idea if he's yelling at your kid. You don't no idea whatsoever. But you do know that two white people are raising a non-all-white kid, and that that non-all-white kid isn't going to have access to your history and experience of biracial upbringings to help him navigate some of the trickiness of not being part of an easily identifiable tribe, right? Right. And you don't seem to feel that to me. Your voice never caught. You've been jovial and pleasant throughout the conversation, Luke, but the fact that you abandoned your son, saw him very sporadically, and now have signed him over to be raised by another man you've never even met. It doesn't seem to strike your heart. Do you know what I mean? Well, it does. It cause, it's, it's the most painful thing I deal with. I even dream about him sometimes. Or I dream about both of them, like him and his mother. And then sometimes I'll see um, this sort of uh, silhouette of his new father. I don't know what he looks like, so he's sort of like this blank character. And uh, I, sometimes I think I get him back or I think I get a chance to see him. And then I wake up from the dream and, and it's like, oh shit, that was all not real. It really does. I really do feel it every day. When did you get the, or when did you sign away your son? Uh, How long ago? About three years ago. Did you have relationships between signing away your son and 
meeting this new woman? Yes, I was. Uh, in between these two women, I dated a woman for five years, and we lived together on and off. So you haven't had a lot of alone time to process the stuff you've done and that has happened to you, right? No, it's always, every time, you know, one relationship doesn't work out, it's within a week, I move into a different one. And that person becomes my best friend each time. Yeah, it's called fusion. I mean, you just merge and you have a lot of sex and you bond and then life catches up with you, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Why did the five-year relationship end? Um, I, I think I was being selfish again. I wanted, I thought about myself and what, where I would have to move for my career. So I moved a couple hours away from her, and we saw each other every couple of weeks. And I think the distance just sort of uh, killed our bond. And she ended up, you know, she was she was a, a ten or eleven as well. And so, there, you know, there's going to be a lot of other guys surrounding her and keeping up. So, listen, I mean, this is a lot of vanity fucking, right? I mean, they look great, you look great, and you're like the Ken and Barbie dolls of shallow envy from others, and right? I mean, you got to start looking for quality over hotness, right? Right. But then you have to start bringing quality to the table rather than hotness too, right? Yes. So, uh, you know, I think, I think... When when people jump from relationship to relationship, particularly when there are disasters in those relationships, you know, like kids you don't see anymore or whatever, I think that junk just accumulates inside us. And rather than deal with that junk, we jump into a new relationship because we're addicted to the dopamine and the endorphins of new romance and sexuality and all that kind of stuff. And the validation that you're still attractive and all of that. But the junk continues to accumulate. And I think we need some time, whether it's alone time or downtime or self-reflection time or therapy time or whatever, we need some time to process all the stuff that happens to us. Otherwise, life becomes this blur. You know, it's like trying to read a book by just flipping the pages quickly, you know. It just becomes a blur. And we don't know where we are. And we don't know who we're with. And we don't know what's going to happen. And we're living just in the concentrated moment of avoiding all that we have accumulated. And you, Luke, have accumulated a lot. And we haven't even talked about your childhood. But you have accumulated a lot in your life. And I don't know that it's had a chance to integrate, to be processed, to settle down, to inform you, to make you wise. And I think that would be a useful thing to pursue. You know, I'm a big fan of therapy, as you know, and if you're dreaming about your son, but I don't get any emotional sense when you talk about him, there may be a disconnect there. But I think you need to slow down, and I think you need to cast off the curse of the pretty. You know, what is it Plato said? Everyone envies. Money, youth, beauty, power. You are always going to attract people for your looks, right? You got a good body? I'm a little slim, but I'm really healthy, and the ladies seem to like it. Yeah, a little slim. Cry me a river, <laughs> oh, I'm just, I'm too lean. Too many six-packs. I can open a beer store down there. So can I, but it's all keg. Um, so it's the curse of the pretties. You know, I, I read a science fiction story, and please, somebody in the comments below, let me know what it is. I read a science fiction story years ago about a pretty guy who lost his looks or gave up his looks. And well, what have you lost? You lost a pretty face. And of course, it's just a metaphor for time, right? Because, you know, you're going to get old. Late 20s, right? Yep. Early 30s, mid 30s, late 30s. You're going to get grizzled. You know, it's like that Eddie, I think it's Eddie Murphy or Chris Rock. You know, you don't want to be that guy in the club, you know, who's like kind of grizzled and. Looks like he's about to break into a gap tooth version of Stand By Me or something, right? I mean, so you're going to get old and your sexual market value is high right now. But the problem is that it's going to diminish over time, particularly if you're not accumulating a lot of resources, right? Right. 
And you got to plan for that. And to be pretty and wise, I like not, I like to think that they're not opposites. Maybe they are, but I, to be pretty and wise is a very powerful combination. And I think that you're coasting on looks and also you're coasting on desire, right? You are um, driven a lot by sexuality, by attractiveness, by prettiness, by hotness, by whatever, right? I mean, clearly, if this woman were 200 pounds, this relationship wouldn't be happening, right? Right, but also if she was a hood rat or if she was really stupid, it wouldn't be happening either. Absolutely, absolutely. But as we already established, smart doesn't mean wise, right? Right. I think that it is a difficult situation. It's a complicated situation. If you get married, I assume that you're going to end up, what? I don't know if this guy is going to stay living, her ex-husband with, with everyone. But you're going to end up, what, adopting two kids or co-parenting two kids, that one of whom you weren't around for the beginning of. You may have new kids, and that would be three kids. Let's say you have a kid with this woman. You then have three kids in a marriage from three different fathers. Is that what you want? Don't you want your own kids? Yes, I do. I mean, there is something biological. Like, I, I know that there's this whole, I love these kids like they were my own kind of thing, or what's that old Red Fox line? I love kids. I got my own kids out there somewhere. <laughs> got kids of my own somewhere but um you don't like you got a connection with your own kid she's your blood she's your flesh there's a lot of propaganda from this gynocentric planet we inhabit about you know well you you gotta love these kids like they're your own that's for men right because it's convenient right for women who chose the wrong guy right for their kids right yep it's convenient but the connection you're going to have with a kid who's yours, sorry, sorry, nature, or sorry, feminism, this is evolution. This is biology. It's deeper. It's deeper. That doesn't mean people can't be good kids to adopt kids. Can be good kids to other people's kids. It can be good parents to other people's kids. But sorry, I care about my own kid more because she's my kid. Women understand that. Women will always know it's their kid. Men, well. <laughs> but my, my plea to you would be to, if you have the option, if you believe that you're worthy and have the option of getting a woman of quality and wisdom and depth, Look, maybe you'll have to sacrifice something in the looks department. Oh, fuck, who cares? You know, everyone's going to get old anyway. You know, and I, it struck me when you were saying, well, four months after the birth of my kid, I left this woman, right? Right. Am I going to guess that you weren't having a lot of sex during those four months? Oh, with the birth mother? Yeah. Uh... Yeah, had plenty. Oh, you had plenty right after the birth of the kid? Nah, well, I, I guess two or three months afterwards, started having a lot of sex again. All right, wow. So, if you can look for qualities of the soul or the spirit rather than qualities of the body or the mere intellect, right? I mean, I get this woman is smart, but I think that you want to try... I mean, if I, if I were to give you a prescription for happiness and I can't tell anyone what to do, I will tell you that, it, you know, if you want to be in a relationship woman for your, with a woman for your life, looks ain't going to cut it. You know, there's an old coarse saying, I think it comes out of Hollywood, it doesn't matter how hot the woman is, someone somewhere in the world, there's some guy who's tired of fucking her. Or it doesn't matter... <laughs> Pretty women, yeah. 
walking around your house, prettiness wears off pretty quickly. And I think we all know that sexuality exists for the creation of children and genitals are compatible for the creation not of orgasms, but of parents. Right? Our, our sex organs are designed to turn us from men into fathers, and our sex organs are designed to turn us from women into mothers. It is not uh, a personal playground of selfish gratification. It is what nature does to make more of us. And I think that if you start to think of sexuality not as release but union, not as relief, but as the building blocks of a stable family structure. I think you'll go a long way towards building the kind of family and having the kind of connection and the kind of stability that is going to be really great for these kids. Because I'll tell you this, Luke. Oh, man. How do you think these kids are going to turn out in this situation? I think these two kids might turn out okay. Even better so if I'm with them. If I decide to do so, of course. How intelligent was the kid who got out of prison? Was the guy who got out of prison? Um, <clears throat> he, from what I hear from my girlfriend, is a very, very intelligent guy who makes really, really bad decisions and had his own terrible upbringing. He's Asian. Um, but it sounds like if he had... A, Isn't this a melting pot? <laughs> it's, yeah, it is. It, but it sounds you mean Asian, like... Asian like, like Chinese or... Like Vietnamese, like half Vietnamese and half white, I think. But it sounds like right. if, he, if he'd had a decent upbringing, he would be a really, really sharp dude. But, so that's the Asian guy who's in prison. I knew there was one. And now we know. <laughs> well. All right. Um, I think that's about all that I have to say. Is there anything else you wanted to mention? Uh. No, Stefan, I just wanted to say thanks so much for uh, giving me the time today, and I really appreciate it, and uh, your work means a lot to me. Well, thanks, Luke. I mean, obviously, you know, I, I grit my teeth and don't tell people what to do. Was was it helpful to get this kind of perspective at all? Absolutely. It's, it's, uh, it's very, very valuable. Thank you very much. All right. Well, thanks, man, uh, and uh, I certainly wish you the best. All right. Take care. Take care.